great. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms, on Facebook, on Twitter, at Illini Drive, as well as Instagram and Snapchat. And we are obviously going to be beginning the show talking Illinois football as the Illini won their first game of the season, defeating the Ball State Cardinals by a score of 24 to 21. The Illini beginning the season 1-0, once again winning their opening game, which we have seen happen quite a bit um, for Illinois athletics over the past couple of years. Well, not athletics, football, more specifically. They've been able to win their opening games, but it was a lot closer than people expected. The game got started off pretty fast for Illini's offense. They were, def- defensively, they got a turnover from Ball State. First play of a red zone drive. Touchdown pass to Mike Dudek, who was probably the player of the game in this one. Then in the second quarter, it was all Illini. Mike Epstein sort of took over. Third quarter was Ball State with their two very long drives, two three-yard run touchdowns from Malik Dunner and then one from James Gilbert. And then the fourth quarter was when it got crazy. Ball State was not able to keep up their offensive momentum. Mike Dudek had the big 52-yard punt return, which led to the Mike Epstein one-yard touchdown run, and then the blocked field goal with five seconds left to earn the Illini their opening victory. So, Jake, opening game reactions. Personally, for me, my first thought from this game, closer than it should have been. (laughs) Yeah, um, that was a lot closer than it should have been. But, I mean, we talked about it uh, last week. Like, the spread was only seven or six and a half. And Vegas always knows. Like, no one should have been shocked by how close it was. Because just by looking at the spread, like, it told us that Ball State is a better team than we thought. But, I mean, initial reactions, it's good to get a win. It was close for a while. It was scary for a while. Um, we talked about how it would have been bad to start the season on a win regardless of the opponent. But, I mean, thankfully, when it came to crunch time, the team, the team brought it out. They grinded it out, and they got a good win. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah, no, I agree. Um, it definitely was a lot closer than you honestly might have thought, like especially heading into it. But um, definitely good to see guys like Mikey Dudek back out there and make some huge plays, like you said, probably player of the game. And then also, especially to see like a young guy like Mike Epstein, the freshman, uh, contributing so early. So um, definitely some good things in there to, to mix in, even though it was a closer game than it might. Yeah, while the mics for the Illini were being successful, Dudek and Epstein, who got the Illini all three of their touchdowns, it was the Riley connection that I think we have. To... Yeah, but I mean, it was the Riley connection that we had to applaud uh, from Ball State, to be fair. Ball State played a heck of a game. Riley Neal was very impressive um, as a quarterback. 21 of 34, 204 yards. He threw a touchdown and then a late interception. Um, And then he also ran for 60 yards on 15 carries. But the key with Ball State's offense, and one thing the Illini defense is really going to have to work on, Ball State was able to score three touchdowns on three lengthy drives. These are 13-play, 15-play, 80-yard drives. But they they got the drive continuing every single time on a long third down third down defense was abysmal for illinois 12 of 21 third down conversion for ball state it was two of 10 for illinois but it's not like sometimes riley neal would throw a pass get a completion on third down but the biggest thing that the illini defense is going to have to work on tommy is it was riley neal finding the space you know the trenches open for him and he was just scrambling for 15 yards on what should have been a 10 yard 11 yard pass play yeah no i mean you're not wrong i mean you kind of hit it up right on the head right there um obviously missing a couple pieces this weekend and seeing guys like jalen dunlop not out there everything like that um that's not gonna be an immediate fix necessarily but i think that once this team kind of gets more experience together keeps going keeps playing i think that hopefully they'll be able to kind of work on that and improve i mean even looking at the time of possession i mean the time of possession favored ball state by almost 14 minutes you can't do that your defense is going to be gassed and i mean we saw it at the end on those third down conversions like we the team just didn't have an answer and so that just let it keep going and keep going and you saw it ball state was running these long plays that they would let develop down the field and then even when neil would end up scrambling out that taxes the defense you can't have that so i mean that's something to work on it's something to look for in week two to see if they can fix that a little bit because obviously, it, I mean, we talked about the Illini defense, how we were counting on them going into the season. But if they're gassed, I mean, they're not going to win any games because they can't make plays. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was just 
stats wise, you if if you didn't see the score final score of this game and you just looked at the statistics, you would think, wait, Illinois lost, right? Look at the total offense: three hundred seventy-five yards for Ball State, two hundred sixteen for Illinois. They ran eighty-five plays at one point in the third quarter, I believe. Ball State had run, I think, thirty plays, scored two touchdowns. Illinois ran six plays. I mean, third quarter it was. Ball State got it first. They drove down the field 15 yards, 15 plays, touchdown. Illinois, three and out. 13-play drive again from Ball State, touchdown. Then Illinois, another three and out. So, I mean, offensively, obviously Dudek and Epstein were the highlights, but we have to talk about the quarterback and Chase Crouch. He didn't perform as we expected. His passing game was not not terrible, only nine incompletions, but he only had 19 attempts. He was 10 of 19, 145 yards. But it was the running game that kind of disappointed. At one point, he had, like, maybe a couple carries for not even double-digit yards. He ended up with 11 carries for 32 yards. But he didn't get any any help from the offensive line. Personally, I think the offensive line was probably the weakest point in this game. Special teams-wise, was great. Blake Hayes, great new punter for Illinois. Chase McLaughlin did miss one field goal, but he did kick a 40-yarder. Offensively, was okay. Like, the skilled players on offense. Defensively... Could have been better, but it's just a stamina thing. Young guys going up against a team that's running 15 play drives. You just don't have the stamina to keep that up. It was the offensive line. I think that was the biggest thing. Chase had no room to move. His pocket presence was not as good as Riley Neal's. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I mean, I think that one thing to be said for Chase with that is that when the offensive line does kind of gel a little bit more and get that together, um, not only will he have a lot more time and improve his numbers through that, but also, I think that one thing that is going to be big in these upcoming weeks, especially with a team like Western Kentucky coming in, is these short passes that obviously, like, a lot of Riley Neal had him um, averaging only six yards of reception there. But I think that with guys like Epstein and Foster around, I think that he could do a lot of passes to the guys in the backfield, and I think that, that could be um, something that kind of almost maybe digs him out of, like, the holes that he can get in with the down-the-field plays. I mean, we saw Mike Epstein has the vision to make plays outside, inside. I mean, inject Mike Epstein screens into my veins. Like, just give me it, all of it. 100%. Like, I mean, he made some nice moves running. Like, he took a screen and would make plays out of nothing. Like, he cut inside, outside. He would make Ball State defenders look silly to me. Like, it looked like they were peewee players. So, I mean, give me all of the Mike Epstein that you can because he clearly knows what he's doing. Yeah, his screen plays looked really good. I thought those were the best executed plays. Last year, they, they were not executed well with West Lunt. I mean, they did a lot of screenplays last year, and they just did not work. As you're listening to Illini Drive here on WPGU 1071, brought to you by the Illinois Fighting Illini. For tickets and information on the Illini, visit FightingIllini.com or call 1-866-Illini-1. Once again, FightingIllini.com or call 1-866-Illini-1 for more ticket information as we are talking about Illinois football's win on Saturday against the Ball State Cardinals in their opening game of the 2017 season. The final score, Illinois 24, Ball State 21. One kind of odd thing that I noticed from this game that, I also, that I've noticed since I've been here, every opening game of the season for Illinois, you have a starting running back, but then the backup running back plays so much better. 2015 in the Kent State game, Josh Ferguson started, but then we saw Keyshawn Vaughn kind of stream himself as, in as the starter. Last year, Keyshawn Vaughn starts. He had an okay game against Murray State, but Kendrick Foster was the highlight of that opener. Kendrick Foster had two huge runs in that opening game against Murray State, and then he became the starter. This game, again, the same thing. Kendrick Foster, eight carries for 20 yards. His long run was nine, but then you had Mike Epstein, who had 62 rushing, two touchdowns, and also 32 receiving yards. All-purpose-wise, he was the man. He was probably the most effective player of the game, while Mike Dudek probably had the two biggest plays of the game with the opening touchdown and the punt return. But is this, a, is this a sign that Mike Epstein is going to be the starting running back? Are we going to see the same thing we've seen with Keyshawn Vaughn last year and Josh Ferguson the year before? I think it's tough to say that after just this one week because Kendrick did have a good year. I mean, he's, he has a good history with, I mean, obviously that what he's been in the past, but I wouldn't rule it out. I absolutely think that Epstein, at least if he doesn't start, he should be featured a lot. He should be that two to three down back every drive because, like you said earlier, he can make those screen plays. He can do anything, honestly. So I wouldn't say make him the starter yet, but it's definitely something that could happen if he doesn't pick it up. I mean, yeah, one game, 
uh, the first game of the season. It's hard to say that. I mean, is it just a flash in the pan that it's just this one game and then he goes and is average the rest of the year? Is this an anomaly for Kendrick Foster? But, I mean, they clearly trust Mike Epstein more in the passing game. I mean, Foster didn't even have a reception. Uh, Epstein had four, I think. Yeah, something like that. He had more than Foster. Foster had zero. And any number is bigger than zero, as we know. We never claim to be math guys, but... Anyway, I think after one week, you have to give Epstein a bigger role regardless. I mean, I think he's earned it after one week. I mean, you can give him a more expanded role and see how he does with that. If he struggles a bit, cut it back to where he's comfortable and just let him wreak havoc with 15 touches, 12 touches. I mean, any way he's on the field right now is a plus as long as it's positive. Another thing that was odd was receiving-wise. Malik Turner and Mike Dudek didn't have the strongest. I mean, they only had six receptions combined. There were only 10 catches the entire game. Lewis Dorsey had the highlight catch. That one, that's the greatest four-yard catch we're ever going to see in Illinois or college football history. That was incredible. I'm glad that it was counted in because he could have gotten on top. Did he get on top 10? Do we know? I didn't I see, didn't. but I mean, definitely deserved it. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, I don't really watch I don't really watch Sports Center anymore, I'll have to admit. But there's a lack of action from the freshman receivers that we thought were going to get a lot of playing time. Ricky Smalling, uh, we thought was going to get some time too. Uh, Carmani Green, we thought would get some targets at least. They didn't really see the ball at all. But the Illini started, I think, 12 true freshmen, somewhere, at least top five in the country for starting true freshmen. Mike Epstein was one of, I think, seven true freshmen in week number one to have multiple touchdowns. So, but honestly, this is the perfect. Lovey said this in the press conference. This is the perfect game for a young freshman to have because it puts you in all the situations. You're down late. You're down early. You know, long drives for the defense to help you build your stamina and get that experience. And for the offense, tough, long third down plays. But now you're going to get a baptism of fire when you have Western Kentucky and South Florida to play as your non-conference schedule just goes up. So... Do you think that this ball, this adversity that the Illini, the young Illini faced against Ball State is going to help them in next week and when they go to Tampa? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we started maybe, what, something like 12 freshmen this I year. think it was 12 that started the game. Okay. So, I mean, that alone, that says something. And showing that shows that we are going to be playing them a lot. So it's good to get them that experience early, especially to have a game with this much scrutiny where it can kind of go back and forth either way. So I don't necessarily think that it's – I mean, obviously it's one of those games, but – I do think that it definitely will help them at least for the rest of the year and kind of give them that little uh, higher pressure situation and kind of be a little bit more comfortable with that. I mean, as far as the offensive true freshmen, you talked about the receivers or the young receivers there who didn't really see action. I mean, Chase Crouch has to throw the ball more than 20 times and complete more than 10 passes first. I mean, we the team ran it 30 times as compared to only throwing it 19. And then that also says to the time of possession – when you have less than 24 minutes of time possession and you're running the ball 30 times, that doesn't give you a lot of chances to get those young receivers or young offensive players the ball. So, I mean, we have to see how it goes in the next couple of weeks. If the line, I figure out how to keep the ball longer and Chase Crouch has to develop that chemistry. He doesn't even have that much chemistry with the older receivers, the upperclassmen who are on the field regardless. So it's a lot of work that needs to be done all around. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... To be fair to Chase Crouch, sure, passing-wise, it wasn't great. But I think within that offense, it's like the perfect crop of players. You know, Crouch is a tough quarterback, can scramble. Mike Epstein's a very similar type of player, comes off of screens, can get a lot of all-purpose yards. Kendrick Foster is too. So I think just Lovey's got to just find the system where they all really work out and just like the perfect amount of play calling where they can really be successful on offense because there was no – there wasn't really any fluidity in the offense. You know, you'll have a 15, 17 yard screen play, but then immediately Foster or Epstein or Crouch just gets stuffed at the line or sacked where the offensive line comes in. You know, offensive line was really young. The center uh, Kramer got injured during the game. He might be out for a really long time. So who knows if Lovey mentioned Meganson might start at center, but probably not. Um, that's probably not going to happen. But lack of fluidity in the offense. But you saw Ball State's offense. It ran really smoothly. You know, even if Neal couldn't throw a pass, he scrambled for 15 yards because there's a big gap in the trenches for him to get those yards on third downs. So I think offensive, offensively, you just need to be more fluid, just nice long drives, 
they didn't go for a lot of long plays. I think that's the biggest thing offensively that Illinois needs to improve on besides the line. But what about defensively? The coverage could have been better, but I think the thing to improve the most defensively is the line because we've seen the line with Smoot and Ward and Phillips in the past. They get by the offensive linemen and get sacks. Illinois did not have many sacks in this game. They were not able to get to the quarterback at all, whereas Ball State, Anthony Winbush had three sacks. They had four sacks total in the game. Ball State's defense, the Illini had two sacks. Isaiah Gay had, or they had three. Gay had a sack, Bobby Roundtree had a sack, and then Delshawn Phillips, who had 16 tackles, leads the Big Ten in tackles, and Kenyon Jackson had a half sack each. So how does that defensive line improve for Western Kentucky, at least, or for the season? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we've had a very good history of having guys like Spoon and everybody in the past. So, I mean, we obviously have high expectations for that position specifically. Um, I, I really, I'm not necessarily worried about them yet because I do think that they still have that talent where they can get out there, they can get after it, get those sacks and some, all those stops in the backfield. So, it's like, I mean, it's really just a matter of getting that pressure. And if they can get out there, if they can get in the backfield, make the quarterback worry a little bit more, I think it all kind of comes together and will make a huge improvement next week. Yeah, we'll see what's going to happen next week as the Illini will be taking on the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers with their red blob of a mascot. I love him. He's cool, but it is a little... At least they have a mascot. We're going to take a quick break here, but when we come back, we're going to have our first official guest on Illini Drive this year. Find out who that is when we return to Illini Drive here on WPGU 1071. You're watching Illini Drive on Urbana Public Television. Tune in Monday nights at 6 p.m. to listen live on WPGU 1071. And welcome back to Illini Drive here on WPGU 1071. Ori Benatar returning here with Will Gerard, Tommy Polson, Jade Hilton, and Jake Hassan. Quick look at the Illini weekend these past couple of days. It's, it was perfect. You, the perfect weekend for Illinois Athletics. Soccer getting two victories against Evansville in overtime 2-1, and then just yesterday against Miami of Ohio 1-0. Football obviously defeating Ball State 24-21. Both cross-country teams going undefeated on the weekend at the EIU Walt Crawford Open. And then volleyball, three wins at the Cardinal Classic in Louisville, Kentucky, defeating Kent State, Western Kentucky, and Louisville as Illinois just went 8-0 on the weekend in all sports. Josh Whitman, coaches, everyone's happy about it. And speaking of coaches, we've got one in the studio as we welcome the Illini volleyball head coach, Chris Thomas. Chris, how are you doing today on this Labor Day? Well, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. Oh, it's great to have you on. So you guys are now 6-0 and on the season, getting three wins in the Montana State Bobcat Classic two weeks ago, and then just getting three wins in the Cardinal Classic. Only dropped a set. How are you feeling about your team right now? Feeling really good. You know, whenever you have that type of performance, you uh, – you, you can't be unhappy about it, that's for sure. And uh, I was talking to you downstairs about just the way we've been playing is really, um, I've really been pleased with. So I'm happy that, that we've been um, having our victories the way we've been doing it. And we've been sort of uh, uh, really on the up and up on the offensive side of things. And, and the good news is I think there's still room for improvement. So uh, it's been really exciting the last couple of weeks and we look forward to this weekend as well. Coach, on this show we talked about uh, how this upcoming week is really important for you guys. Uh, the Pac-12 is really strong. So how does it, going 6-0 and to start the season, getting on this good run, how does that help you going into this tough stretch coming up? I think it always gives you confidence is the first thing that we'd be taking a look at. And, uh, you know, when, when you're practicing, it's, it's difficult to tell how good you are because you're always playing against yourselves and you, get, you know your own players and, uh, and your own players know the other players' tendencies. So until you actually play someone else, and uh, see what everyone else is doing. It's it's difficult to get a gauge. So these last two weekends were really good in terms of getting confidence. And like I said, how we did it was was really good as well. So I think that's uh, good. And and this weekend is a big challenge. Uh, you know, reigning national champ Stanford, and and then uh, we've got Colorado, uh, an up and coming Colorado team coming after that. So uh, again, another challenge is kind of see where we're at and see where we're going heading into a Big Ten conference play here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, to give some context for this weekend for volleyball, it is the Big Ten Pac-12 Challenge at Huff Hall this weekend. The Illini opening their season at home against the defending national champions, the Stanford Cardinal, on Friday night at Huff Hall at 7. It is the Stuff Huff Night, which is the Illini Pride Spike Squad Night, where they try and fill the entire uh, Huff Hall. And besides the fact that Stanford are the defending national champions, former Illini coach Kevin Hambly is now the head coach at Stanford. So what kind of reaction have your players kind of had, you know, going up against their former head coach and you're going and 
going up against a defending national champ and a powerhouse in Stanford. Sure. I, I think uh, whenever you get to play the defending national champ, it's a cool event in general. And of course, we're trying to tie it, uh, stuff up, like you mentioned. Uh, we're doing a ten, two ten thousand dollar give, giveaways for the students this weekend. If you make a serve, if you get picked, you get to try to make a serve inside a, a you know carved out hole that they're going to put out there. And so tomorrow, actually, we're opening up practice for students to come in and watch and help and uh, and practice chance with Spike Squad if they're interested in that. And then uh, and then we'll teach them how to serve at the end of practice. So to heighten your chances of winning the ten thousand dollars if you do get picked. Um, so we're trying to get a lot of student uh, uh, support here for this match along with the general community, but the chance to play Stanford and, and, uh, and you know, be the uh, defending national champ will be a big deal. So our, our girls are we're pretty focused today for a Monday. You know, it's easy to kind of uh, take a break and, okay, it's Labor Day weekend and no one's at school, but they came in ready to work and I think they're hungry for this win. We should go out and practice for those serves. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we'd have a shot. I mean, Jay could play volleyball. He's got the height. I'm still working on my kicking for the open football tracks. <laughs> Remember, I had my jorts. Oh, yeah, I had my right. jorts proclamation. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you're, you'd probably be, you'd probably be in the front. I'm like a. Le are liberos the shorter players? Usually, usually liberos. Sometimes the setters, depending if you only have back row setters, but uh, usually liberos. Yeah, but you can kick the ball in. There's no stipulation against that. So. Yeah. 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 In high school, we used to play um, like. We did volleyball, but with our own rules, we could kick serve. If you got on the other person's side, you had the right to. Uh, rough them up a little bit. Sure. So. Yeah. I well, like those rules. <laughs> I love, I, honestly, honestly, volleyball is one of the most fun sports. I never played it competitively, but like I, every spring, whenever our high school was like, oh, you know, baseball, I don't know if we want to do baseball this year. We're not that good. And we were like, we, we need a men's volleyball team because we just all played it after lunch. And I mean, What's your what? How did you grow up with the sport? Is this something you just instantly that, had? No, that's kind of how I got in the game too. Uh, I had uh, I was in middle school, and they're like, "We need two more people to to fill the team." So my buddy and I were like, "All right, we'll give it a try." And we played, and it was only a six week season or so. We tried it, we liked it. Um, you know, kept going playing basketball, other sports that we would normally play. And then uh, next season came up again. We started out, we played. We had two really good coaches, and then that led into high school volleyball. High school led into club. Um, I didn't know it was, you had a chance to play Division I men's volleyball until later. Um, I ended up going to the University of the Pacific and played there for four years. I was All-American there, played on the national team, played professional for a handful of years. That led into coaching from there, and it's, here we are. Here we are now, <laughs> 18 years later. <laughs> I, I imagine, I played golf in high school, so I imagine telling people you played golf is kind of like telling them you played volleyball in high school. So, like, what was your, because, like, I always never know how to open that. Like, yeah, like, I played golf in high school. So, like. What, what was your line like always for like what telling people what you did in high school? <laughs> Usually uh, <laughs> I, I've had, I'm laughing because I've got some, you know, I got visions of, of some responses that I've gotten where it's like, you play volleyball like with the girls team? No, no, no we, there's men's volleyball. So you, California is a little more of a mainstay. I know Chicago area has some men's volleyball as well. But a lot of times, actually, when you tell them you coach volleyball, they ask if it's men's or women's still. So, uh, yeah, but it's it, it, I played everything. I went to a small high school. I graduated 18 people in my senior class. So we played soccer. I played basketball. Yeah, I played everything that they had us do. So, uh, but growing up playing men's volleyball in uh, California was, uh, was was cool. I mean, we, the beach was right there. I grew up in Santa Barbara. So um, when I wasn't indoor, I was playing on the beach. And that's kind of how it fell in love with the game. So, oh, indoor. I like indoor a lot better. I like the team aspect of it a little bit better. And, and not that sand volleyball isn't. Uh, or beach volleyball isn't a, a team because you got another person you're dealing with, but it's just a lot more on kind of a chess match of, of all of it with the X's and O's and, and figuring out psychology of working with six people. And it's it's really a game where all people have to be on the same page. If one person's off in a given night, it's really difficult to to uh, to win, which is why, again, I'm impressed with how we've handled our business in the first two weeks here. So. Kind of a It kind of has already uh, in terms of doing it in the Midwest. It's tough just because the time of year that it happens. And so if the if it doesn't get warmer until a certain, you know, till what is it? April ish, then March, April, depending on consistently, then it gets difficult to have a season because their championship is in April or uh, May, I guess it is. And uh, so it's difficult just to have competition to play. So if you're going to go have to play other teams, you have to go to the south or you'd have to go to California and play it to be just a big budget, you know, kind of uh, crunch to try to create a team. There's no one near that's 
that that has a, has a team. So it's just been difficult for that reason. But down the road, I can see if other Big Ten teams start to add it and they, maybe they add indoor facilities, then there could be a definite possibility. So. I just find it interesting how whenever the Olympics come around, because that's kind of when the entire country starts to notice volleyball a lot more, beach always gets a ton more attention than indoor. Why do you think that is? Because indoor for me, just watching it, it's super intense, yeah. ton of fun. Beach just looks really hard and annoying. <laughs> That's well put right there. Uh, I think beach gets it just a little bit more uh, due to the fact they've had a lot of success uh, on the beach for a long period of time with Misty May and Carrie Walsh. Carrie Walsh is still playing. Um, I think she's going after Olympic medal number five or something like that, this, this next quad here, and she's still doing well. And so there's a little more uh, personability with that as opposed to all six. Um, and then the indoors, indoor teams started to do well in the last probably eight years, last two Olympics, they've done well. So I think there has been more coverage as time has gone on. Um, I also think it's a little bit easier to understand the beach game than it is the indoor game just because of the rotations of the indoor game, the strategies of the indoor game. You know, sometimes in men's volleyball, the, the rally ends really soon. And so that's not as exciting to people all the time. But uh, it, it really is an awesome game on both ends. But uh, I think I think the the sand game is a little more watchable in terms of rallies and there's diving saves and these other things that happen a lot. And, and they tend to do a nice job with the atmosphere. The FIVB does, so it's, it makes it fun to watch as well. Yeah, but I think most people when they're watching indoor, it's not just the rotations that might confuse. It's the fact that there's one person on the court that's wearing a completely yes. different <laughs> color than the rest of the team, <laughs> and everyone's like, "Why is in every single Olympics?" You just go on Google, you just search volleyball, and I'm sure the first thing that comes up in auto search, why is there one person yes. wearing a different yes. color? That's, that's called a libero, and it actually in Italian means free, and so it's, they get that uh, because it's a free sub pretty much. So it usually is your shortest player, yeah. and they get to run. <laughs> they get to run in and out as long as they're running in and out between the same two positions. They can't run in uh, at any given time, but, uh, or actually you could. It, theoretically but usually they come in for the middle blocker um, for defensive purposes speaking of italian um I'm a, I'm a big research guy and so i tried to wikipedia you and your page <laughs> i don't know if you know this isn't like all i assume is italian it makes no sense i was so confused and, uh, uh i gotta so see I that i don't yeah, think i've ever seen that it's all in not english and okay. so just yeah. couldn't do the proper research okay on our end so I, is there any reason, or is it like, did you do that so uh, we no, couldn't I, do research on you? I did not you? do it. Let's see. This page, it looks like you put it in Italian. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen that before. Uh, I think, well, my only thought there is the Italians are huge into the sport, and so maybe it's someone who's Just a super, huge Chris Thomas super fan. <laughs> super fan in Italy. My wife actually played professional in Italy. So uh, maybe it comes from that, but I actually never seen this before. Hey, they got my high school in here. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it looks like they got most of the teams you yeah. played for. You know, yeah. Orion, Guada. Yeah, yeah, those are all my pro teams. But if you want to follow Chris Thomas on Twitter, his Twitter is in English, not Italian. <laughs> you can follow him at Coach Thomas, but Thomas is spelled T-A-M-A-S. Again, that is at C-O-A-C-H-T-A-M-A-S. And you have a big social media following, a ton of the – um, Illini students who are involved in the media kind of notice your Twitter because you're always posting fun pictures and fun gifts. You know, how do you see social media for you as as a platform? Do you see it as a way to sort of let loose and be yourself, or do you see it as a way to communicate that you know? Oh yeah, all the above. I think now, especially with recruiting, what as well recruits look at that um, at the age we recruit people at right now is usually seventh, eighth graders when we start taking a look at them. As as crazy as that sounds. But uh, I think that uh, it is a way, it is myself on there. It's not like I'm sitting there all day thinking about what am I gonna tweet today? It just kind of comes up and uh, organically and I just have fun with it. And it's a good way to interact with the fans. We interact a lot with uh, our Spike Squad as well. They get into it too. So that's uh, just a way of communication and, and uh, it's just to show ourselves a little bit, a little bit more. My, my assistants and my director of operations has one too. And they're, they're, we all have fun with it, so. Uh, I think social media is just, you know, kind of where everything's gone and and uh, and uh, I, re I do enjoy it. So it is it is fun to have interactions with people. Uh, one question I have for you, Chris, was how was it locating to sh relocating to Champaign and like what were some of, what was the appeal of this program? Why did you want to come to the University of Illinois? Good question. Uh, you know, when I when I was uh, first got offered this job, I, I really didn't know much about Champaign because I'd been in the Big Ten, both with Nebraska and with um, 
in Minnesota for so the, between those two schools for four years. And all I knew that everyone asked me the same question when on my interview. I said, "Why, why Illinois?" And uh, you know, I said, "Well, uh, I know Huff Hall, and I know, <laughs> and I know uh, I Hotel. Those are the two things I know. I never ventured over here. I didn't know much I about Hotel's it. I Hotel's the second thing you knew about this yeah. place. Yes." Usually when you come into visiting venues, you just kind of go, you're, you got to do your, you know, you got to go about your business. Um, at those, both those schools, I was in charge of scouting. So usually I was behind a computer screen in the hotel room, just, you know, trying to figure out how to beat uh, Illinois at the time. And, uh, and so I didn't know much about it. So I actually asked all my interviewers, why, why should I come to Illinois? And they, two, the two answers they gave me were, um, one, because, you know, the people here, they said the people here are awesome, the, the support with the student support. The other reason, as I knew, they had the, one of the best uh, fan clubs in the land uh, with the Spike Squad. I knew that. And so I gave that as a reason. Well, part of the reason knowing Huff is, is knowing that they had a really cool um, uh, fan club. And we used to sit there at Nebraska, you know, like, how do we get a student section like that? And uh, the answer, after being here for six months or so, you can't, you know, it's, they're one of a kind. And so we appreciate their support. But the other answer I got was because of Josh and his vision uh, for the program. A lot of people who I interviewed with had used, used to, he used to be their intern and they have a lot of trust in what um, Josh is doing and, and the way he's doing it is, is, uh, is really cool to see and everyone is, is uh, behind them. So just the leadership and, and, and what he's doing and bringing people in here that are you know, excited about being here, I think is a big deal as well. I mean, when you have other coaches here, you know, recent hirings with Lovey and Brad and Nancy and uh, you know, a few others, yeah, I think it's, it ends up being a, a cool you know, kind of synergy, so to speak, of, of coaches and, and uh, I don't know, just feeling around the program. So it's been really positive since I've been here. So I appreciated that. Final question for you here, Chris. What did you think of the football game yesterday? Were you at the game? We were actually in uh, in Louisville, so oh, we, yeah, yeah no. we were we were still playing. But I we were. Know, I don't know how I forgot that. We that were was silly. We were fun. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. Or if you just learned Italian. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but what'd you what'd you <laughs> okay? What'd you think of the game? First the Illinois football game. You know, now a Champagne native. You know, what'd yeah. you think of it? Well, I uh, we were watching on. Um, on the you know live stream at back of the hotel everyone was all huddled in the hallway we were we had just gotten back from a scout and uh and we were just you know pulling for the team i think uh i talked with lovey today for a little bit and he was saying they've got something like i don't know i forget the percentage but they have a lot of underclassmen or true freshmen that are playing and so when you get all the i have nine of them myself more than half my roster is freshmen i think he's kind of in the same boat when you when you get that it, it gets really difficult to get them on the same page for their first game because they're all amped up. They're excited. You know, they're playing under, you know, however many people are there. And, and, uh, it's good. They, they came away with the win. Sometimes you don't look at how it's done. You look at, you got it done. So we used to say on the national team, a win is a win is a win. So it doesn't matter how it ends up. It's one and all <laughs> or for us six and all. So, which is good, good to see, but I, I will, we will be attending. We have, um, stuff up on Friday. Saturday is against Colorado at 2.30. We purposely moved that match so we can have both uh, fans go for a volleyball and football, and we'll attend a uh, football match that night. So, Well, Chris, we wish you good luck this weekend. Stanford, Colorado is going to be big games for you guys. Wish you good luck. Thanks for coming on yeah, the show. Thanks for having me. Anytime. This was Christopher Thomas and un ex palavolista <laughs> e allenatore di palavolo statue in Tense. Si, grazie. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Head volleyball coach Chris Thomas on the show just now. We are going to take a quick break here on Illini Drive. When we come back, we will talk a little bit more about some college football and some other Illini stuff. We return to Illini Drive here on WPGU 1071. You're watching Illini Drive on Urbana Public Television. Tune in Monday nights at 6 p.m. to listen live on WPGU 1071. Back to Illini Drive here on WPGU 1071. It is 6.46 p.m. here in Champaign, Illinois. Quick weather report. There is a severe thunderstorm watch until 10 p.m. tonight. Uh, radar, a little bit of red cells that could be coming around. It's very humid. Um, and then for tomorrow, beautiful day, expected high of 74. But now back to the sports here. I'm Ori Benatar returning with Will Gerard, Tommy Polson, and Jake Hassan. Jade Hilton had to leave early. Had Chris Th Thomas on the show. Great guy. Fun to have him on. Illini Volleyball is going to have a big, big weekend. I'm, I will be at the Stanford game for sure. You guys might be coming there. We'll see. I mean, it's a big weekend in general for Illinois sports. Stanford and Colorado for volleyball. we got the Western Kentucky football game. 
And then soccer's on the road in Oklahoma. Cross country will be in action also. But let's talk about the rest of the college football weekend. Big Ten had a good weekend. I think only three losses for Big Ten teams, which were Indiana against Ohio State, Rutgers, who put up 14 more <laughs> points than we all thought they would against Washington because they scored 14 points, losing to the Huskies, and then Purdue losing to Louisville. And also Purdue put up way more points than I expected. Lamar Jackson did not have seven touchdowns, as, as I predicted on <laughs> Saturday. I thought he would have five by the half. But a great weekend for the Big Ten. Illinois getting the win, Ohio State getting the win, Penn State dominating Akron. Um, Wisconsin crushed Utah State. Michigan. Maryland over Texas. Yeah, Maryland beat Texas. That was crazy. We were following the game during the Illinois, um, during the Illinois game. Maryland 51 points against Texas in Texas. Michigan won, and they're all yellow unis, which is weird. <laughs> just still not used to that. Yellow is just a color you can't go all in on. You cannot do all yellow. And, like, the NFL tried to do with the Jags with the color rush and all yellow, and it looks awful. Like, any time you try to go majority lo- yellow, it doesn't look good. Uh, it depends on the – I mean, soccer, yellow is classic. Brazil's yellow shirt's, like, the most recognizable soccer jersey in the world. But they have, like, blue shorts. They don't right. go all no, yellow. I'm saying – we're saying how to all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Can't I mean, do yellow helmet, remember. the yellow shirt, the yellow pants. I, I mean, Illinois uniforms look pretty good. Michigan's on the other hand. Yeah, I think the yellow, the yellow tops is cool, but it, they needed blue pants or like black or something, and that would have looked a lot cooler. But the rest of the college football action: Alabama defensively shut down Florida State. Their quarterback DeAndre Francis Francois. Francois, Francois. That Francois. is right, Francois. He is out for the season. He got injured. USC had a bit of a scare against the former row the boats of Western Michigan. They ended up winning Sam Darnold, leading them 49-31. But the most notable game of the weekend, which happened yesterday, was the incredible UCLA comeback against Texas A&M. Down 44-10, to and spooky stuff. UCLA scored their first touchdown in the comeback the exact same time that the Patriots scored their first touchdown in their Super Bowl comeback. UCLA, 35 unanswered points to beat the Aggies. 45-44, um, Rosen, Josh Rosen with the fake spike, 491 yards, four touchdowns, which wasn't the best day for a quarterback because Mizzou put up 70 points. Um, we saw a couple of other teams put up 70 points, but unbelievable comeback from UCLA. That, that's the game of the week for sure. Right. I mean, A&M looked so good to start that game, and it's. I remember seeing the early scores, I think 21-10 or something like that, and right away, even then, at that point, it just didn't even look like it was that close. And, I mean, obviously the score could indicate differently, but the fact that they came back and won that game was unbelievable and good for Rosen, good for that, all that whole team to be able to stick with it that whole time. But that's a tough look for someone in a and Yeah, I mean, Jake, looking at the Pac-12 at least, USC's looking pretty good, UCLA's looking pretty good. But for you, what was the most impressive performance of the weekend out of, you know, all the big ranked teams? I mean, it has, I think it has to be used out of ranked like the top, like the top teams competing for playoff. Who was the most impressive? If we want to say that, I mean, you have we're to not sur- talking ranked yet, but I'm still saying my guys over Notre well, Dame. Well, uh, <laughs> speak, speaking of the Irish, I was going to give our – we're going to do a weekly Notre Dame undefeated <laughs> watch. The Irish beat the Temple Owls 49-16. to 16. They play Georgia next week at home at 6.30 p.m. It is a big weekend of college football. But most impressive team, you have to also consider the, the competition. I might say Penn State. 52 nothing Against Akron? Come on. But Il- if Illinois saying, would put up 52 against that's, Akron. Uh, that, that's fair, but <laughs> I don't know. At the same time, I watched a good amount of that game and just watched Saquon Barkley out there, and he's on a different level. I mean, he just runs through guys. Like, yeah. it's not even close. It's not fair. I don't see it. I don't know. I mean, like you said, Akron, but they showed up and they did what they should have. I honestly, I'm, cons- I'm considering Michigan. I think Michigan was the most impressive team because – Florida is a good squad. They beat a ranked opponent. They had good, a solid offensive day. Defensively, they were good. Whereas Alabama, Florida State didn't have their starter. They didn't put up many points. Ohio State had a very bad start against Indiana. USC as well. Excuse me there. Kent State. I mean, come on. Kent State against Clemson. <laughs> you knew Clemson was going to demolish that. But Michigan, probably the most impressive ranked team. But I'm sorry. The most impressive Big Ten performance for me personally is Rutgers. Only losing 30-14 to 14 against Washington, I think, is a monument. Oh, yeah, I forgot about Although, Maryland. You always forget Maryland. Maryland, the thing with that, though, I said it last week, Texas should not be ranked. They lost to Kansas in football last year. That alone should start you at the top 25. 
I don't know. It was obviously still a huge win for Maryland, great for their program, but I don't know. If I had to pick one from the Big Ten, I'd easily say Purdue because I thought that for a minute, at least watching some of that game, that they were actually going to beat Louisville, and that would have just been a huge upset. Uh, Ranked-wise, I would kind of want to take a look at one of the Illini's upcoming opponents, South Florida. Uh, they won 31-17 to over Stony Brook. They were losing at the half, and then they came out and outscored Stony Brook 24-7 to in the second half. So that kind of they showed why they're a ranked team a little bit. They flexed a little bit in the second half. Kind of they were losing to a bad team, uh, and then they came out in the second half and just kind of put them away. So that's interesting to watch. I mean, I know South Florida's kind of up-and-coming program. They're 19 right now, so maybe that kind of solidifies them and their position as a ranked team. Big Ten-wise, Indiana, I mean, they played well against Ohio State, I think a lot better than people thought. I mean, I think Ohio State, Ori, you probably thought Ohio State was going to win oh, by like 70. No, okay. Or at, at the start, I thought it was going to be like a 30-point win, but – I was watching the first half, and I was like, what is happening? It's like a rerun of the Clemson game. We couldn't score a touchdown, but then JT just decided, you know what, Let, that, that's it. We're scoring. J.K. Dobbins was like, you know what, I'm going to become the new Zeke, the new Maurice Claret. I'm just going to run all over the Hoosiers. So, yeah, I, I thought Ohio State, awful start, but they just ran away. They looked really good in the second half. Dobbins looked really good. Dobbins looked great. Ohio State has the game of the week next week. They're hosting the Sooners, who they did beat handily last year in Norman, so pretty confident Ohio State can do well. Some of the other notable games over the weekend that are big games. I mean, you got Cincy against Michigan. That's going to be a fun one. Uh, what else? Pitt-Penn State's always a good game. I'm excited to see that. Georgia-Notre Dame, Stanford-USC, Auburn against Clemson, it's going to be a sick week in college football, and I think there's a potential to have a ton of nail-biting games this upcoming weekend. Which one stands out at you the most as probably this game could be, you know, coming down to the last player go to overtime? Um, don't say Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I don't think that'll be close just because with Eason going down and everything, he's out. He's out indefinitely, so... Um, some I can't remember his first name, but From is going to be starting for Georgia. I so Notre Dame wins by a, I don't a think hundred. It's going to be close. Yeah, Wimbush is going off. He had a great week his first week. He looked good with his first uh, real big start. The closest game I would agree. I think that Ohio State will pull away, but I do not see it being like that. I I could easily see that going into the fourth quarter within ten points easily. It could go either way, but I don't know. I definitely think Ohio State will pull that out. Okay, well, that was going to be my pick, Ooh, so I'll just... USC-Stanford, uh, too. Yeah, so my, my pick instead is going to be USC-Stanford. That'll be pretty good. Stanford's always tough. Um, they're kind of in a transition period since they lost luck a, a few years back, and now McCaffrey's gone. Obviously, a lot's changing over there. Um, on the note of the Ohio State and Oklahoma game, that could be a shootout easily mm -hmm. with, oh, yeah. with JT Barrett and Baker Mayfield. I mean, Mayfield missed one pass in week <laughs> one. I just had it up, but he missed one pass. His quarterback rating was like 96-something. So that game is going to be awesome to watch. That's just going to be all the points. 96 is not that good for QB rating. I mean, he missed one pass, and he did three or four touchdowns, and he's got that awesome mustache. So yeah. um, that'll be cool. And then, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of good games overall. Um, Washington State and Boise State. Boise State's usually a pretty good team to watch, yeah. pretty fun team to watch. Washington State's underrated. They are underrated. They have been for a while. I'm kind of interested to see how Florida responds to their loss against Michigan, against Northern Colorado. Obviously, it's Northern Colorado, so it's kind of like, ha, whatever. But, I mean, Florida's been very volatile the last two, three years, so they could easily lose that game. Yeah, definitely. I, I think Florida could potentially lose. If they did lose to Northern Colorado, could be one of the, yeah, could be one of the biggest upsets of all time. And we did see, technically, the two biggest upsets in college football history, according to the Fantastic statistical thing that is the ESPN SPI. Big quotation marks in that. I'm sorry. Also, shout out Cam Newton's little brother there. Cam Newton's little brother at Howard uh, getting getting the best of UNLV. And before that, just right before that game ended, Liberty beat Baylor, which is a huge win for Liberty, um, who occasionally get to the NCAA tournament um, in basketball, football-wise, not even close. <laughs> Jake's looking at Florida Atlantic, who got crushed by Navy. Yeah, R.I.P. Lane play, Kiffin. Yeah, Lane Kiffin is not having a good time so far with the Owls. Got crushed <laughs> by Navy. They're playing Wisconsin in uh, Madison next week. That is going to be a tough game for Florida Atlantic. As we got a couple more minutes here on Illini Drive, let's give a quick score update. 
U.S. Open round of 16 action. We've got a marathon match happening between uh, Del Potro and Theme of Austria. This is five-setter. Del Potro leads 3-2 in the fifth. Federer just started his match. Nadal moves on to the quarterfinals on the women's side. Number one seed Pliskova moves on, uh, only losing a game to Jennifer Brady. Coco Vandewey is on to the quarterfinals as well. One more ranked college football game, Tennessee against Georgia Tech in Atlanta. In baseball, the Cubs fell big to the Pirates, 12 to nothing. Jake Arrieta leaving the game in the middle due to a right leg injury. And also, uh, the Red Sox are playing right now. They just scored two runs against the Blue Jays. It's now 3-2 Toronto. And finally, because I'm doing the score update, we're going to do some soccer. Justin Verlander, starts Justin Verlander starts tomorrow for Houston. But a quick soccer score update. World Cup qualifying continuing in Europe today. Germany, huge 6-0 winners against Norway and England after a rocky start defeating Slovakia 2-1. Germany could have officially qualified today, but they did not. Tomorrow is the final day of World Cup qualifying in this sort of September section. The United States plays at Honduras at 4 p.m. They pretty much have to win if they want to get to World Cup. I know Tommy's going to be watching the game, or he's going to be following. I will. I'm starting to pick up soccer, and, I mean, I don't, it's, 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 it's slowly getting there. You know, I don't really know necessarily who I want to watch, all that kind of stuff yet, but I'm starting to get into it, especially when it comes to national teams and everything. It's always fun to watch. Yeah, World Cup is going to be coming up. Uh, there's also a couple of big games in Europe. For the record, for the record, I've always said national soccer is more exciting than just like regular run of mill soccer. Club. So, <laughs> baby steps, Ori. Baby steps. Club is good. I do like international because come on, the World Cup is the greatest sporting event in the world, better than the Super Bowl and the Champions League okay. and All the right. World Series put together and the BCS, All right. which doesn't exist anymore. Okay. <laughs> it's about 7 p.m. here. Here in Champaign, we are going to be calling it as Jake actually has a fantasy football draft that's starting in 40 seconds. And what? He's got the eight. Oh, he's got the last pick in an eight team league. You know what? I kind of prefer being at the last because then you get those back to back. You get those, yeah, you get those back to back. I kind of like it. I like the back. I had the first pick in a six team. I picked David Johnson number one. I ended up with a pretty good team. So we'll let Jake do his draft and we'll let the rest of us head home and enjoy the rest of our Labor Day. I'm picking Robert Aguayo. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to pick first a overall. first overall kicker. <laughs> for Jake Hassan, Tommy Polson, and Will Gerard, I am Ori Benatar. Thank you for tuning in to WPGU to listen to Illini Drive. Thank you for watching on UPTV on this Wednesday night. We have been on, brought to you by the Illinois Fighting Illini. For tickets and information on the Illini, visit FightingIllini.com or call 1-866-Illini-1. FightingIllini.com, 1-866-Illini-1. Be sure to tune in tomorrow night for Luke and his guys for another edition of Illini Drive right here on WPGU 1071.